and police in Canada have charged three Indian nationals with murder over last year's killing of a prominent Sikh activist in Vancouver, which sparked a diplomatic row. Now on BBC News, it's time for Talking Business. Hello, everybody. A very warm welcome to Talking Business Weekly with me, Aaron Heselhurst. Let's go and take a look at what's on the show. There's a magic to cities, which is that by concentrating people and jobs and infrastructure and buildings and amenities together, they start to magnify and multiply each other. Yep, the future of our cities. They're the engines of the world economy, driving 80% of global economic activity. And despite taking up just 2% of the planet's land mass, cities are home to well over half of the population. That share is growing rapidly, set to be nearly 70% by 2050. I'm going to be discussing all of that with these two. There they are. One's a top urban expert who's worked with 400 cities on everything from transport to demographic change and climate planning. And the leader of one of the world's most livable cities, known as Australia's Garden City. We're going to find out from the Mayor of Melbourne why it's so appealing. And how do you balance the needs of 5 million people living side by side? Also on the show, we're going to take a look at what it takes to create our spaces. I'm going to be joined by the big boss of Autodesk. It's the world's top software designers for architects. Wherever you're joining me from around the world, once again, a big hello and a warm welcome to the show. You know, our cities, they're, they're home to governments, cathedrals, universities, hospitals, hundreds of millions of homes and billions of people. They dominate the global economy, but they also generate the vast majority, 70% of the world's carbon emissions. The world, it has become more populous than at any point in history. And since 1980, the proportion of people living in urban areas, it has soared. In that year, it was just over 39%. By 2007, for the first time, more than half of the global population were living in an urban setting. And here, in 2024, that number is now nearly 60%. It's projected to be 68% by the middle of this century. And if that trend continues, more than 80% or, or four in five of us will be living in towns or cities by 2080. That means there'll be six times as many big cities with a population of more than a million people. But some regions are becoming more urban than others. South America, for example, it's the most urbanized continent with 85% of people living in towns and cities. While in Africa, it's around 46%. And we're going to hear from our colleagues in Lagos, as well as Sao Paulo, in a moment. But first, let's head to India. We know that country is the world's most populous, but it's still very rural. Fewer than 40% of Indians live in an urban setting. But that is changing rapidly. Here's our business correspondent in Delhi. Here in Delhi, India's capital is one of the fastest growing cities in the world. And it's estimated that in the next few years, it is also going to become the most populous, with a population of over 37 million. Now, with more people, of course, there's growth and development, but there are also challenges, like more people jostling for space with limited resources. Over the past few years, we've seen this region see property prices rise at over 30%. Every summer, Delhi also battles a water crisis because the only river that supplies water to the city has seen its levels deplete over the years. And the biggest challenge, Delhi became the most polluted capital city in the world last year. And experts say it's because the environmental norms are not properly enforced in the city. So while India remains one of the fastest growing economies in the world, this growth is also coming at a cost. This is Lagos, Nigeria's commercial nerve center and home to an estimated 21 million people. Listed amongst Africa's most popular cities, traffic congestion is a major challenge. Motorists spend an average of four hours commuting daily with a huge negative impact on productivity. As one of Africa's fastest growing cities, Lagos is also marred with a public transportation issue. The yearly rainy season exposes one of Lagos's biggest challenges, which is recurrent flooding. As has been the case with other parts of the world, people's lives are being disrupted by heavy rains. 
Experts say a combination of questionable urban planning, poor waste management, and climate change have worsened the flood issues. Here in Sao Paulo, Brazil and Latin America's biggest and wealthiest city, inequality is a significant issue. One of every four homeless persons in Brazil lives in the streets of Sao Paulo. Citizens of affluence and poverty contribute to another serious problem, violence. Property rates reached a record high last year in downtown Sao Paulo. But violence is not the only problem at the city center. Sao Paulo authorities have struggled for years to deal with an open-air drug market called Cracolândia, literally Crackland, where over a thousand crack cocaine consumers live and where drug dealers work openly. Okay, some views from around the world there. So, let's now turn to my first guest, who's one of the world's top urban experts. He's worked with 400 cities to help them steer through the, well, the challenges of growing through changing times and changing populations. Professor Greg Clark, great to have you with us. And Greg, let me start with this, just the obvious. Why are cities so important? Because obviously they're home to huge numbers of people, but what is it about this kind of living environment that gives cities the, well, their wider reach and their impact? There's a magic to cities, which is that by concentrating people and jobs and infrastructure and buildings and amenities together, they start to magnify and multiply each other, creating more jobs, more opportunities, more interactions, more relationships, and connectivity underpins all of that. But because of that magic, we're living now in a kind of century of cities. This is the biggest industry in our world for the next 50 years. Building and making and operating and running cities is the thing that's going to attract the most capital, it's going to attract the most attention. It's where the big opportunities are. And Greg, if we're going to see this projected growth and even further over the coming decades, I mean, how? How do cities prepare to cope with the growing populations? There's two versions of urbanization. There's what we might call bad urbanization, where growth out housing it's transport systems, energy units. But if we can plan well for population growth and we can think about the economic change that's going on, then we can get good urbanisation. We know one challenge many cities have in common is how to house these ever-growing populations. So I've got to ask you, Greg, how do they address building sustainably in a way that people and especially key workers can afford? There's only really four ways that any city can accommodate population growth. The first thing is it can sprawl. The second way you can do it is by building new cities. And there's been lots of experiments in building new towns, new capital cities. The third way is that you can build up in cities. You can really increase the density in our cities. The fourth way, though, is that you can connect the existing city with neighboring suburbs, cities and towns in a kind of networked approach, which allows them to benefit from having good transport systems that link things together. And Greg, we've been hearing a lot about these so-called 15-minute cities, which you support, but just for the uninitiated, what are 15-minute cities? How do they work? It's a great question, and the problem is that it's got a slightly wrong name, because we're not actually talking about 15-minute cities. What we're talking about is districts and neighbourhoods within cities where people can find within a 15 minute walk of where they live all of the things that they need to go about their everyday business. Am I right by thinking that, you know, the critics to these 15 minute neighbourhoods is that they talk about, well, local authorities, that they put car restrictions in place as an example. So you, you, you can't drive from one section to another without getting a penalty. I mean, that's what a lot of critics will point to, won't they? Yes, absolutely right. And there's a genuine debate here about whether the individual should be free to drive uh, polluting vehicles in large numbers from one part of a city to another, almost for any purpose that they want at any time of day in any volume, or whether the effects of air quality on pollution on the health 
and the contribution that that makes to carbon emissions, whether, um, as it were, uh, locally democratically elected governments have the right to try to reduce the incentive to do that by imposing fines. And Greg, we've seen many cities struggle with urban decline. I mean, you've got some rust belt cities in the US, for, uh, for example, Birmingham here in the UK, Turin in Italy. Greg, what can be done to, to drive fresh investment into those cities? The built environment in our cities, not just housing, but all of the corporate real estate, all of the big facilities, all of the infrastructure, including the transport infrastructure and the utilities, the water, the waste, the energy system. These are massive investment assets. Urban revitalization is a big opportunity, not just for governments to take a lead in making the city livable, investable and connected again, but it's also a massive business opportunity uh, for investors for corporates and also, of course, for small enterprises that want to pilot new urban solutions. What scope is there for, for cities to become self-sufficient hubs for energy generation? Every city in the world has a different opportunity to create much more self-sufficiency in terms of energy. As we know, our energy systems are beginning to decentralise. The introduction, particularly of solar, in the hot countries of the world is enabling both individual buildings, whole districts of cities, and indeed whole cities to move towards energy independence. The second one, of course, is the geothermal energy that exists under the ground. And we see this increasingly in Scandinavia. We see this happening uh, in Spain. And we also see geothermal being a solution in Canada and in North America. In other parts of the world, it has to come from other kinds of renewables, including in particular hydro and wind, not necessarily energy generated within the city, but energy generated close to the city. And Greg, let me end on this. What makes some of the world's top cities really popular places to live and work? Can you name some? There are a number of cities that are consistently voted as the best cities in the world to live. One of them, of course, is Singapore. Another one is Vienna. Another one is Vancouver. And of course, a fourth is Melbourne in Australia. It's extraordinary what's been happening there in terms of the energy transition, where the city and its leaders are working together so closely with the business community, the utility companies, the superannuation funds and others to prove that the business end of making cities really exciting is just as important for business as it is uh, for population as well. On that note, Greg Clark, chair of the Connected Places Catapult. Great to have you on the show. We'll check in with you soon. Thank you very much, Aaron. It's been a pleasure. So, Melbourne, huh? I don't know about that. I'm from Sydney. We've got our gorgeous harbour. And for those who don't know, Sydney and Melbourne, we've always had a very friendly rivalry. But I have to say, for Melbourne, it's a ringing endorsement from Greg Clark there. So let's just find out why the capital of Victoria, a city with one in five of Australia's population and known as the Garden City, is just so popular. Well, I decided to catch up with its Lord Mayor. Sally Cap, a real pleasure having you on the show. And Sally, let me start with this. I've got to tell you, this is probably one of the hardest interviews I've done in many years. And I say that because I am from Sydney, born and bred. But your city, Melbourne, it consistently enjoys a top 10 place in global livability rankings. I've got to ask you, why do you think that is? What's so special about Melbourne? Melbourne has put an enormous effort into being a livable city. We came from the 80s and early 90s, uh, a financial crisis, a time when the city was described as a moribund city in a rust bucket state. It doesn't get much worse than that, Aaron. And uh, the city leaders at the time, together with other levels of government and uh, private sector leaders, decided we had to do better. We've really focused on being the original 15 minute uh, suburb so that people can access uh, education, health services, employment, uh, leisure, uh, study, all within a 15 minute radius. And we continue to invest in elements like 
active transport, greening the city, uh, elements that we know are vitally important for liveable cities. And Sally, you've been Lord Mayor for, for six years and of course Melbourne has been a top place to live for, for many years. What's your personal legacy for the city? That's a really big question given that the you know, last few years have included uh, the very extreme circumstances of the pandemic. In fact, Aaron, we're one of the cities with the most days experienced in lockdown. It was very, very traumatic. And so for me, a major focus has been kick-starting the city and then resetting the city for a new trajectory, a new rhythm, uh, a different future, but in many ways also a better future following that major shock. Uh, within that, though, there are some key projects. One of them is called Make Room, which is to provide housing and support services and dignity for people rough sleeping in our city. Another big project uh, which has a long legacy is uh, called Green Line, and it's the rejuvenation of four kilometres of the North Bank of our Yarra River uh, that goes through the centre of our city uh, into beautiful uh, nature, open spaces and places for events. And Sally, correct me if I'm wrong here, but I understand that since COVID, the heart of Melbourne has become very popular at weekends, indeed busier than during the week. And I kind of think that's a problem, isn't it? Because I'm just wondering, how do you get the public sector workers back into the office? The new rhythm of the city really is a reflection of the different ways that people are working. And frankly, we have to embrace flexible working. It is here to stay. We championed our flexible working for decades prior to the pandemic. From our perspective, we want people to want to come back, Aaron. So all of our initiatives and investments are really focused around the other things that people want to do in the city. And Sally, let's talk about sport, because we know Melbourne has amazing stadiums. It's home to, well, most of Australia's biggest AFL clubs, football for, for our global viewers. Uh, it's a multi-billion dollar industry, but your state government concluded that it couldn't host the Commonwealth Games. Sally, did you fight that decision? The decision by state government uh, about the Commonwealth Games was really uh, a difficult one to accept and understand at the time. One of our strengths is uh, the quality and quantity of uh, sporting and event infrastructure available within our city. And uh, we're the only city in the world that hosts both a Formula One Grand Prix and a Tennis Grand Slam. Uh, and that's really just the tip of the iceberg for being able to host 100,000 fans to see Taylor Swift or Ed Sheeran uh, in any one time through to, you mentioned, the AFL, where the average audience in our stadium is uh, last season was 73,000. We really can do things at scale. And Sally, of course, as we know, Melbourne, it is the host city to uh, the Grand Prix. You've got the Grand Slam tennis. You've got the very famous Melbourne Cup. Sally, what do these events do for your city? We've really built our city around major events. So they're uh, a, a critical uh, foundation to our economy, but more broadly than that, to our DNA, to our identity and how we like to operate as a community and society. Uh, so from our perspective, of course, uh, economic activity and returns on our investments in those types of uh, events is absolutely critical. And Sally, I've got to ask you this, because yes, Melbourne's also known for its, its art and culture, but also for your widespread graffiti, which, which let's be frank, it isn't loved by by all your, your citizens. How do you see that? Does it add or, or take away from Melbourne's reputation? And, and how are you managing that side of, well, Melbourne's reality? Well, Aaron, let's be really clear here. Uh, there is street art, which we love here in Melbourne. We are renowned for street art. 
for recognising uh, the talents of so many artists who literally take over our laneways particularly. And in fact, during COVID, we took the opportunity to uh, commission more street art, uh, beautiful murals uh, and artworks uh, with another 40 laneways transformed during those quiet times. What we don't tolerate is tagging and graffiti. It is illegal uh, and we're putting more efforts than ever before into removing uh, tagging and graffiti from across our city. And Sally, let me end on this. I mean, you're stepping down in June, so I've got to ask you, what's left undone? What's on the in tray for your successor and, and what's your message to them? We've got uh, major projects that go over years. I mentioned Green Line earlier, rejuvenation of the North Bank of the Yarra, uh, Queen Victoria Market, our uh, major open air market uh, and new uh, commercial, residential and retail precinct uh, in the city. There's just a never ending list of things that need to be done urgently. For example, retrofitting of current commercial buildings, their top emitters in our city. Currently about seven buildings uh, a year being converted and that needs to be 80 if we're going to hit our target of being a zero net city by 2040. Sally Cap, the Lord Mayor of Melbourne. Fabulous to have you on the show. Good luck with everything and we really appreciate your time. Thanks for your interest. Go Melbourne! OK, so how do we build and adapt the structures to house the residents and the workers of the world's great cities, and especially given the need to be, well, more sustainable, with buildings that chew up less energy than ever before? Well, that's the challenge facing the construction industry, and especially architects using state-of-the-art computer-aided design technology. Well, I decided to speak with the big boss of the world's biggest software designer for architects. Andrew Anagnos, great to have you on the show. And Andrew, let me start with this because this week's show, we've been looking at the future of cities and some of the big challenges facing urban planners. So I have to ask you, how do these challenges, how do they affect your business model? The cities of the future are going to be very different, but also very similar to what we have today. And some of these challenges you talk about are pretty fundamental. One, cities need to be greener. They need to be more sustainable. They need to be more energy efficient. They need to be managed more effectively. But also... Every single city in the modern world is suffering from infrastructure that needs to either be maintained, rebuilt, or built from scratch to, to, to meet new demands. And of course, one of the big changes that we've seen since the pandemic, Andrew, is, of course, the, the big rise of working from home and the knock-on effect on office space. How, how has that affected the way your customers use your software? It's, shifted some of the emphasis from in urban planning to reconfiguring spaces for either new types of occupancy or actually new types of use. Some, some facilities that were commercial office space are now turning into residential units. So what people are doing are focusing a lot on reconfiguring space, reconfiguring space and redesigning the space. And they're using our software to do that. Let's now look at the, the big path towards net zero, because in Europe, they, they have the Green Buildings Directive. Older buildings now have to comply with these very tough emission targets by 2030. Andrew, how do you help make that happen? The way you have to deal with existing infrastructure is you got to scan it, you got to understand it, and you've got to have suggestions on how to build it. So we help with the scan, analyze, and recommend part of the problems here. And if we look at some countries, I mean, let's take Italy as an example. It has a vast number of older buildings. Andrew, how can historic buildings be, be brought up to greener goals without destroying the character of those buildings? It's a really tough problem, Aaron, all right, because you want the building to maintain its look, its, its, its historic uh, authenticity, and all the things associated with it. But at the same time, some of these buildings are really leaky from an energy perspective. Let's take aside stained glass and all the beautiful type things like that. How do you create a more efficient window environment for these buildings with, while still maintaining the authenticity? This will create kind of whole new opportunities for people to build multi-pane windows that actually look like authentic older windows. Or people will be coming up with, with technologies to add glazing or extra panes behind stained glass that make those windows actually act like a multi-pane window. 
We know in many places there is a, a real lack of affordable housing. How do you support your, your customers to fulfill the housing requirements that are, are just so vitally needed today? There's lots of complexity in the housing industry, but what we are very passionate about at Autodesk is helping people figure out how to build these houses more efficiently with less materials and more effectively. We are very interested in helping people industrialize how they build houses. And what I mean by that is taking some of the lessons learned from the manufacturing industry and applying them to the construction industry so that you can actually build cheaper, more sustainable homes on a more rapid basis than you ever had before. And Andrew, let me end on this. In 20 years time, will our cities, as we know them today, will they be vastly different? Will they, will they look different, act differently? They will likely be vastly different. I think they will be hyper-connected cities. 20 years from now, who knows if we still have cars? You just don't know how the world's gonna evolve. If we still have cars, the cities will actually manage the flows of the cars through them. There's going to be greenery inside the cities. There's gonna be uh, urban, urban farms on top of roofs. There's going to be more sustainable buildings. There's going to be new types of roads and infrastructure. People don't have enough money, people, or materials slash resources to build and rebuild everything that needs to be built. So we got to solve that problem today so that we can get through this capacity problem so that we can get to that bright future in 20 years. Well, on that point, Andrew and Agnos, the big boss of Autodesk, great to have you on the show. Good luck with everything, and we'll check in with you soon. Thank you, Aaron. It's been a pleasure. Well, that's it for this week's show. I hope you enjoyed it. Don't forget, you can keep up with the latest on our global economy on the BBC website or the smartphone app. Of course, you can also follow me on X. X me. I'll X you back. You can get me at BBC Aaron. Thanks for watching. I'll see you soon. Bye-bye. Hello again, it's the bank holiday weekend, of course, and I think mixed is probably the right word to describe the weather over the course of the weekend, because while there'll be some warm, sunny spells for many of us, there'll also be some sunshine and showers as well. And this morning, certainly, it's been quite wet across parts of northern England into Northern Ireland. We'll continue with that rain, I think, in Northern Ireland into this afternoon. The risk of some showers, though, in the far northwest of Scotland with some sunny spells and with the sunshine in the south, we may just see some showers popping off across the far southeast of England. Those could be heavy and thundery, but warm, sunny spells across many southern areas, temperatures 17, 18 degrees Celsius. We may once again have the warmest weather in the west of Scotland, 19 or 20 degrees. Now, through tonight, we'll continue with a bit of rain across parts of Northern Ireland, central southern Scotland, maybe a few thundery showers in the far northwest. Beneath the cloudier skies, temperatures down to about 9 to 11 degrees but with a clearer skies, once again, quite a chilly night. Temperatures on Sunday morning starting off at about four to six degrees. Now, during the Sunday, there was some cloud in Cornwall, parts of Devon, a few showers here. One or two showers developing elsewhere across England and Wales, but largely dry with sunny spells. Some heavier showers in the northeast of Scotland with some thunder. And maximum temperatures about 16 to 18 or 19 degrees. Once again, it will feel quite pleasant when the sun comes out. On into Bank Holiday Monday, we've got this weather front here across the south, and that's going to bring more cloud, some showers across southern areas of England, a few showers further north likely as well, and again, those could be heavy, maybe even a bit thundery into the afternoon. But for much of North Wales, the Midlands, into eastern areas of England, it looks largely dry. There'll be some sunny spells as well. Temperatures on Monday perhaps down a little bit, so 14 degrees there in Aberdeen, about 15, 16 Celsius, further south and east across England. But going through the rest of the week, high pressure is building in. And when we see high pressure like this, certainly in the spring, it's looking dry, it's looking fairly sunny and actually quite warm as well. Temperatures will be responding quite nicely to that sunshine. So you can see here that the temperatures will start to rise 17 to 22 degrees Celsius by the end of the week into next weekend. So on the whole, a pretty settled week to come. That's it for me. Bye-bye. Live from London, this is BBC News. Counting's underway at centres across England as we await the results of mayoral elections in cities including Liverpool and London. Meanwhile, the Labour leader has been out meeting the newly elected mayor of the East Midlands. Sir Keir Starmer says he's confident London will elect Sadiq Khan.
if you look at the overarching picture and the purpose, the purpose is to serve our country. This is the last stop before the general election and we've made significant and very real progress. Good afternoon, I'm Geetha Gurumuthi. Welcome to this BBC local election special. The Prime Minister is insisting the Conservatives have everything to fight for, despite the party losing nearly half the seats contested in England yesterday. Labour is buoyed up after winning over a 1,000 council seats and key mayoral cont contests in the East Midlands and, of course, in Rishi Sunak's backyard in Yorkshire and North Yorkshire. Well, this is what we can expect over the next few hours. Results are expected in the six remaining regional mayor races today, and that includes Greater Manchester and the West Midlands, where the Tories will be hoping Andy Street can cling on. All eyes will then be on the capital to see if Sadiq Khan can win a third term as London mayor. Rumours have been swirling that the results between Mr Khan and the Conservative candidate Susan Hall will be much closer than the polls have suggested. And we're also expecting results from a handful of councils, as well as 10 police and crime commissioners. While well, the Labour leader, Sir Keir Starmer, has been speaking following a rally this morning to celebrate Clare Ward's election as the first mayor of the East Midlands. He was also asked about the London mayoral contest. Sadiq Khan was absolutely the right candidate. He's got two terms of delivery behind him and I'm confident that he's got another term of delivery uh, in front of him. Um, but look, if you look across the country, I'm standing here in Mansfield, in the East Midlands, where we've won a significant victory in the mayoralty here. But that's the pattern across the country. We've been winning you know, in Blackpool in a by-election with a 26% swing. We've won in York and North Yorkshire, true blue Tory territory. And here in the East Midlands, where there are very many constituencies that matter hugely in that general election. So, you know, all of this is done with a purpose. I want a Labour government to serve our country. This is effectively the last stop on the journey to the general election. And I'm really pleased that we've been able to show we're making progress, we've earned the trust and confidence of voters, and we are making progress towards that general election. So a very, very good set of results for us. You've not won councillors or mayors everywhere you wanted to, though. How damaging is that to your prospects of becoming Prime Minister this year? Well, we have won uh, significantly in um, all places across uh, the country, whether that's by-elections, whether that's mayoralties, whether that's councils, and of course the police and crime commissioners. Now, in some places we didn't get all the votes that we wanted, and of course um, we will fight to get those votes back. But if you look at the overarching picture and the purpose, the purpose is to serve our country. This is the last stop before the general election. And we've made significant and very real progress everywhere that we needed to do so. So I'm very pleased with that. I was speaking with your victorious East Midlands candidate, Claire Ward, yesterday. She said that she will put the region first, regardless of who is in number 10. Given that in the past we've seen Conservative mayors at times criticise Conservative governments, if you are in number 10 by the end of this year, she could become a bit of a thorn in your side, couldn't she? I would expect Claire Ward as the East Midlands mayor to absolutely put the East Midlands first. That's what she should do, roll up her sleeves and fight for every single person that voted for and every single person who didn't vote for her in the East Midlands. If we're able to form a Labour government, that is actually a massive advantage for the East Midlands because it means that you'll have a government and a mayor able to work together. But do I expect her to fight for the East Midlands? Absolutely, that's what she would uh, do. I intend to fight with her for the East Midlands. Sir so Keir 